Good morning, Hope Church. Things look a little different around here um, because we're going to do something a little bit different. So if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Jess, and nice to meet you all. Um, I have invited a few friends to join me, so welcome the Halliburtons. While we wait for our next couple, can you go ahead and introduce yourselves just sure. in case they don't know you already? Sure. And how long have you guys been married? That's what I would like to know. Well, I th if you were here a little earlier, David mentioned that today is our anniversary of 34 years. Well, welcome to my other friends. Uh, would you like to introduce yourselves and share how long you have been married? We were mingling. I'm sorry? <laughs> We were mingling. Oh, yeah, you were following the rules until the timer was up, so good job. Well, we are Dawn and Bev Kelly, and coming this coming April, April 27th, we'll be married 50 years. Does that make us old or what? <laughs> and I tell you what, I'm going to keep him for another 50 years. I mean, he's a good man. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, my husband wasn't able to join us today. He sends his love. Um, but we've been married for five years. And um, so that's been a good time. We also dated for three leading up to that, which is an eternity in the church, it seems. Most people are in a rush to get that done. But we were taking our sweet time um, because we have eternity and stuff to look forward to. Um, <laughs> but so why we've gathered you all here today, I'm sure you're wondering. Why I've gathered you here today, I'm sure you're wondering as well. Um, we've been in a series called Real Relationships, and from the top, um, starting to talk about, and actually, let me start with this. How, how many of you have, you're caught up, you were here week one of Real Relationships? Beautiful. Week two? Week three? And you made it to week four. Look, all you, 100% success. That's awesome. If you missed it, you can go catch it on our archive on our website, hopechurchmt.com slash messages or find it on YouTube. Um, but would highly encourage you to go check it out because Pastor Lance has done a really good job of setting up the conversation for real relationships that has kind of set the table for us to end up at one of the most celebrated relationships by God is marriage. So for those of you who are not married, don't check out. I promise you there will be something that you will take away today that will help you for your future marriage, or perhaps not even marriage, will be a practical application just for relationships in general. So we guarantee 100% uh, cash back if we fail you. Um, we guarantee that there will be something, so I hope that you will stay engaged um, with this conversation because I think the ultimate thing that we have learned through this series is that Relationships are complex, and vulnerability is very scary, and things get messy just with people in general, and um, they're messy because we're not perfect. They're messy because we all have a history, and they're messy because you also hurt me sometimes, right? So relationships are messy, but they teach us a lot about what it looks like to be like Jesus and to love the way that God loves. They take honest, healthy communication and a lot of grace and forgiveness. Like we really get to practice what it is to love like God with each other, right? And we have a lot of opportunities to shut down and run away, but when we lean into it, something beautiful really does happen. And so we're gonna start with a passage that I'm sure all of us know and many of us had read at our wedding ceremony if you're married. So 1 Corinthians, did anybody eye roll? They're like, I oh, know. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and we're really going to take our time reading through this because as beautiful and poetic as it is, it's also really weighty. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts. That can be a hard one sometimes. Love always hopes, always perseveres. And say this last one together. Love never fails. Can we just take time to pray really quick? God, I just thank you for every person in this room and everyone joining us online, both now and in the future. God, I just thank you that wherever they are right now, you have something really unique planned for them to hear. I thank you for the wisdom in these chairs. I thank you for the vulnerability that will be shared that will help others and encourage our hearts as we lean into a very treasured relationship that is marriage. God, I just pray for anybody who's even now in the waiting that you would give them hope, that you have good plans for them. And for anybody who's sinking in their heart, God, this is a challenging subject for me. God, you are gracious and you are kind and you are present here with us. And so we just thank you for the truth of your word and the kindness of your spirit and have your way in this conversation today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we shall begin. And as we're talking about, we're talking about love and vulnerability, the complex, the messy, in the context of marriage, perhaps. Perhaps that's what we're here to do today. But what are some things, perhaps, for the Halliburtons that before you got married, you thought, this is what marriage is, and this is how it's going to go, but then you got there and you're like, well... <laughs> yes. Very, very, very idealistic picture of marriage. And in my opinion, and I think even in David's opinion, we were very much alike. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually are. Whereas a lot of, that's the one thing that differentiates a lot of marriages is that they're very different and they're attracted somehow we're more alike and I really did feel like David was the greatest gift God had ever given me <laughs> but <laughs> it was harder and harder to believe that at times <laughs> at, after we got married. I, I wanted him. I wanted to believe that. I wanted to keep believing that. We had to work and work and work to bring that reality <laughs> to fruition. It was so worth it, though. For me, it was the uh, fear of rejection. If my wife really knew me, uh, that I would be rejected. And I was really afraid of being tender, uh, as a tender warrior. And I was afraid of if she really knew my heart, then she would reject me. So that's one of the things that we've worked on is, is being, my, myself being vulnerable and, and not fearing her response, but actually welcoming her response and saying, Father, I want to be a tender warrior before my wife and honor her, but yet also step into her feelings and her dreams and visions as well. And, and the ways I've hurt her over the years and really own that ex and, and, uh, and own it, but also then make some choices and make some hard choices to make it to change. And one of the things we've done for 34 years is that we have called our marriage, it's been bliss blisters. Did you get it? <laughs> It's been bliss, but it also has been blisters. And we'll leave where the blisters are at. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to be continued. So what are some things for you, Bev, that you may have had an idea about marriage? This is how it will be, and this is how it will be treated, and this is how I will treat them, that perhaps got a little shaken up once you were married? Okay. Or was there anything? Because it's perfect. Oh. Far from perfect. <laughs> I think we just need to be really honest. Life is messy. Marriage is complicated. And I think when I got married, I mean, we loved each other so much. And so don't all couples, they love each other so much so they will have no problems. That's just how it goes. Wrong. 
But, you know, the coolest thing about it is, you know, I have the marriage I want after 50 years. I mean, we have grown so close together. And in my vows, when Jess read that First Corinthians, um, I, I, I just, like, love never fails. And I, I'm so thankful I started my vows when I wrote them that Christ's love never fails. And we can only do these things through Christ. So getting back to the question, um, I thought when I dreamed of the perfect person, the guy I'd have in my life, he would just be like perfect. He'd always say the right things at the right time, and it would just be kind of like that. I and, that <laughs> <laughs> and so in a, um, he would just like kind of be very refined and everything. That's in my mind what I thought, you know, that's the kind of guy that probably God would give me. And you know what? I needed somebody way different in my life because I did not know how to communicate. I, d I was a, somebody who had stuffed my feelings. And I am so thankful for this man here because he helped me realize that I could be myself, and but I needed to be real. Mm -hmm. I needed to be who I was. And just to a little um, difference in it was like our family, we were very affectionate on the outside, like we could hug and, and that type of thing, but we didn't really share our deepest feelings. And in his family, you knew exactly where they stood. And I mean, at a dinner table, I'd say, I just can't get this. You guys always fight. And he goes, fight? We're not fighting. We're just communicating. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I needed him in my life because I needed to learn how to communicate. And I needed to know that, you know, so many people think marriage is disposable. Marriage is not disposable. Marriage is a covenant. And so we have to work through the covenant. So I, I'm not sure how many years you have to work at marriage, but it's sometime past 50. <laughs> and uh, when, when I uh, first met Beverly, I'd just come out of the water of baptism in the Milk River, and uh, there she was. And uh, we were very different. She was a sweet little farm girl and 16 years old, and, and I uh, had just gotten off of drugs. And so, uh, but I kind of liked her. And so I went back to uh, college in Missoula to finish up at the university, and I, I started writing to her. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to write to that l little girl because she doesn't know me. And, and I told her all my dirt. I thought, well, that'll, that'll be the end of that thing. <laughs> she wrote back to me, and, and God really used her and continues to use Beverly in my life. But she reached inside of me, this little 16-year-old Canadian girl uh, reached inside of me and, and made me realize that I was a new creature in Christ, that, that I could be forgiven for my sins. I had accepted Christ, but I had a lot of guilt and shame. And uh, Beverly reached inside of me and touched my heart. And, and uh, by the spring of that year, I realized I was in love with her. My letters started saying, Love Dawn. And then she got a bunch of love poems. I got a book of love poems sit on, sit on my desk. Her mom liked them. Uh, <laughs> made her nervous. <laughs> but uh, that summer... I think I might have kissed her once before I asked her to marry me, but, but maybe, I, I, I think maybe so. We were on our way to church, and we were both looking out the window because I was picking up this, this girl to give her a ride to church, and Bev turned around too soon, and we were right there. So being an opportunist, <laughs> it, 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 it would have been a church kiss. It was not one of those real good ones. But... Anyway, so that was it, and we're sitting there that summer. She's sitting in a she's sitting in a lawn chair in my parents' backyard. We had a church convention going on, and I looked at her and I said, "Hey, would you marry me?" And she said, "Yes." I didn't know what I was saying is what I told them later. <laughs> oh man, well. I'm sure many of you are like me. You look at these beautiful couples and you think, wow, what 
perfection, like you've really figured it out and there was no hard things and maybe you had communication differences, but we wanna get, we wanna get real, we wanna be vulnerable and, and help some people. So we'll start with the Halliburton's. Is there anything that you would be willing to share that you experienced in your marriage that were just real things? Yes, we experienced real things all the time. And that's because the marriage relationship is that relationship that brings up, bubbles up all the real about each one. And it's designed that way. God designed it that way. So we experience the heights of heaven. We experience the depths of hell. And one particular time about 12 years ago now or so right here in this church we had one of our hardest journeys to freedom in our and healing in our marriage relationship that revolved around addiction and if any of you understand what it's like to love someone who has an addiction you understand too that there, because of that, there are qualities that to having closeness that are non-existent. And so, what what we've been doing as we reckoned and faced that very challenging part of our marriage to heal and to receive freedom is also build up the things that create closeness, good communication. Um, uh, uh, what are some of the other things? Um, yes, vulnerability and, and checking in. We have, I brought this as an example. These two books, we started with this one on our five-year anniversary, and we've continued to this one because we filled this up. We, we bring these books with us on our anniversary date. And we write our dreams, we write where we're at, our history for that year, our prayers, our hopes. Wow, so stop, that's so good. I, I wanted to say that uh, uh, I grew up in a household with a uh, father who was a rageaholic, alcoholic, and uh, the number one thing you had to do is keep the secret at any cost. And so I grew up with, with you keep all secrets in. So my life of my addiction to pornography, I kept in, I hid that. I, I did not want, obviously didn't want to have my wife know, but also being a pastor, a young pastor, who, who could I go to, who could I be transparent with? And I finally had, had a great friend of mine, Dr. Ray Ortland, come to me, and I was in a small group with him, and he said, David, as a pastor, you're always on the verge of taking that next step of disaster. You're one step away. And, and where, what are you doing to have men around you that can help you walk towards wholeness? And with that, I, I, we sought out counseling. I still remember the day I was terrified to say, honey, would you come to counseling with me? Because I wanted to share with you a secret of my life. And, I, and, I, and in my life, I was petrified of rejection due to my household upbringing. But in that time, my wife was terrified to step in that journey with me. But with the grace of God and her determination to stay with me, we are here today. Thank you for sharing a little bit about that journey, and we'll dive in some more. Don and Bev, is there anything that you can recount in your marriage that was like a real, real that you had to walk through that perhaps people would be surprised to know like, oh, you struggle too? <laughs> I think our real low spot, and we shared a lot at our marriage retreats, is the between the 21 and 25 year, right in there. And during that time, we were very successful. We were pastoring, we were loving people well, and we were serving Jesus well. But during that time of our life, I really went into a deep, dark place with inside of me. 
I kind of lost touch of who I was. And, and during that time, there was a lot of changes happening in our life. Our oldest daughter was getting married. Our youngest daughter was graduating from high school. This is more toward the 25th part of it. Um, we were leaving our church that we loved and knew and the community we loved and knew and we were moving away to Washington. And during that time, I lost touch with who I was. I couldn't remember our story any anymore. I felt so lonely and so isolated. And during that time, my husband, who he was so kind and he was so loving, and he would, we, we began to, I believe during that time, started to really truly respect each other's heart. Mm because it was messy. He had, remember I said I wasn't a communicator, so I would had stuffed all these things for all these years even though I was doing much better. He had to dig in there and reach and feel like, why, what, what was I feeling? And one of the key phrases during those years, he would say, honey, how is your heart? And when he said, how is your heart? That was, I could tell him anything. One thing that I admire him so much for, and I'm thinking, I don't know if, I mean, he, it was amazing. He'd say, hon, tell me what's bother you, bothering you, even if it hurts my feelings. Even if it hurts me, I need to know. And so from my perspective, I mean, that was a beautiful time of our testimony. Sometimes we don't like to share those parts of our testimony, but it's to God's glory. It is his testimony of how he brought us through. And so we share that saying we had low times, but God brought us through. He was the one who brought us through. Yeah, I think it's important to, to uh, say that, you know, if you're gonna have a long-term marriage and the, the commitment really keeps the, keeps the marriage together more than the feelings, because feelings kind of ebb and flow, and I, I thought we were fine. <laughs> Why not, eh? So we're fine, eh? Until one day Beverly came to me and she said, I would like more time with you. And, you know, I've always kind of admired myself as being brilliant. That day was no different. <laughs> I said, why don't you make an appointment like everybody else? Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> so anyway, I realized that maybe there was a problem. And uh, she said, she said uh, we need counseling. And, and I had all, because I was a counseling pastor, and I, I got nervous like all the guys that got dragged into my office. And I said, well, we can go talk to Dr. Kaft, and he was a friend of mine up in, in Haver. And, and, uh, but then I, being a wily coyote, I said, why don't you just make me a list? You know, because I was pretty good at working lists. And, and you know, it wasn't that easy. What I, what I found was that my wife needed an emotional connection with me. And I'd gotten so busy doing life and pursuing my career, which was a good career, and trying to love people and, and help people. But um, Beverly wasn't, I, I had to fight for her heart during that time. And, you know, I had to battle with myself because I thought, well, I already won her once. Why do I have to win her again? And, uh, you know, that year, that first year, and it, and it, and it lasted uh, probably four or five years, we, we were in kind of a slump. We, you didn't know it from the outside because we were pastors. We, we looked good, but we hurt inside, and, and I had to uh, learn some things about how to fight for my wife. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I thought, you know, there's... I had to learn how to listen to her. When she got me, I was really rough lumber. And, and I think she got a lot of slivers in those days. But I had to uh, ask her to tell me. And some nights, you know, I, 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 my wife's heart, she said to me one day, she said, you talked me into marrying you. 
And I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> but I realized that, that in the course of life, you can drift apart. And I had drifted from Beverly. And uh, I had to win her back. And I, I remember one night standing at the kitchen sink, and, and I had my... I had my elbow on the, on the counter and my head on my elbow, and I, I just bawled like a baby. And we were just two blocks from the church where we pastored. And I walked down to the church, and I turned on the music in the sanctuary. I laid down with my nose in the carpet, and I cried out to God for my wife, for her heart, for our marriage. We weren't talking divorce or throwing things at each other. We don't cuss at each other. Didn't then, don't now. We didn't, we didn't call each other names. We didn't, didn't then, don't now. But we had grown apart, and, and I took ownership for that. And I'm crying out to God for my wife. And I think, I think in that year, I, I, I lived on about three hours of sleep a night because I had to learn how to listen to her. And, and she's just like a teenager. She talks when, when you're wanting to sleep. <laughs> and she still does that. But I just, you know, folks, it's, it's real. And, and it's uh, never give up. Never give up. You know, just it's if we're free, there's a release in that. Mm -hmm. And and we'll talk a little bit more about that after. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing and being so raw and open about that. It's really beautiful. I think, you know, Elizabeth, you started to suggest that like marriage out of most relationships, all relationships, but marriage especially shows you your rough edges and I think what's really challenging for us as people is you know we all love the idea of iron sharpens iron but we have a really hard time putting it to application because iron against iron when it starts to rub there's sparks and it gets hot and it is friction that is not a fun time but if we decide not to lean into it we actually rob each other of the the, the purifying. We rob each other of the sharpening. If we would just grind it out and lean in, we both become better for it. And I think that is something that I've seen in marriage and what you've experienced and what you've experienced in marriage is it helps us become more as we are designed to be like Christ. I also think um, what's beautiful about marriage, but what's also kind of misconstrued by culture and a lack of true understanding of some of the language in the Bible is the idea in Ephesians where it communicates husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and then further down wives submit to your husbands and that gets so misconstrued but what we see is the beauty of two surrender to God leaning into that sharpening becoming more like Christ that that's the magic like that's what makes this union and this covenant so special so hard but so beautiful after 30 50 and so on so on years um and i just love that you don your story really models that this humble man going before god saying help me help me fix this help me pursue help me fight for my marriage and I'm sure you've experienced it in your, in your marriage too, that it's not just one doing the work, it's us both partnered, submitted to God. And that's, you know, when we get to the word submit that people seem to trip over, it's easy to walk through because we understand who we are submitted to. And that makes things like 1 Corinthians easier to read when we're applying the question to myself. And it is, is Jess somebody that can be trusted is just patient is just kind does just envy it's easier to walk that out because i'm submitted to christ and i want to love like he does i love romans 12 19 in the nlt it says don't just pretend to love others really love them 
really love them. Marriage is a commitment to continue to show up despite the things that have been hidden and come to light. I'm gonna love you anyway because love trusts and love doesn't give up. And, and I think something that you've both expressed is how to truly love David and how to truly love Elizabeth and care for each other's hearts. So what are some ways that you learned to deal with some of those insecurities that come up? Because I, I imagine, especially in a marriage covenant, hearing about an addiction, trust gets stabbed, you know, or, but even for yourself, you express being vulnerable, that's, a, that's not a good time. That's something that you were coached as a child not to do. So how do you two, how did you two learn to walk through that having like love for your partner? Well, what comes to mind is, first and foremost, you're, none of us are able to see ourselves in relationship. But certainly, I could see there was a dynamic going on as we would attempt communication. And one of the ways I learned to relate was with um, a family model of conflict where you yelled when you were dis in disagreement and you one up one another and you got the last word. So that was my style of relating to David, which would um, actually shut him down. He would be almost speechless, which made me feel more need in that moment of thinking I'm telling you something that I need, and that was the other part of it, was I didn't know how to just share a need. I had to get angry enough about it to like have it blew out, spew out. And so it was this combination of seeking counseling and hearing, letting someone who could see us relate. And it was almost like instead of iron sharpening iron, we like we're going the wrong way <laughs> against the sharpener until we actually understood what was going on and that I had to actually be vulnerable when I needed to share something important and David would be able to then hear it and respond more readily and it it did feel like we started to sharpen, mm -hmm. sharpen one another in an honoring way because that's the Lord's heart is that he, he doesn't want any of us to pretend something isn't happening in our relationship when it's hurting us. Mm -hmm. He wants us to be honest and honoring and he wants us to protect one another's dignity in this very rich, meaningful relationship of marriage. I, I wanted to speak to the singles just for a little bit. Uh, for me, uh, if you're out, out here single, I was so af afraid because of, the, of what was modeled to me at home of being in a very volatile home that I thought I can't risk to be known or risk to be in a marriage. So I want to encourage you. I surround, By the grace of God, I surrounded myself with uh, a campus ministry that helped me and having brothers and sisters around me and then also therapy as well but I just want to encourage you if you're single I just want to encourage you to step into your own story and then say Father would you bring people around me that will model what a healthy marriage is model healthy relationship with that this is our anniversary weekend uh, that's Friday. We're at home, and we're we're gonna. I'm gonna take my wife away to Airbnb that somebody gave us. We're packing. We're all excited, and then uh, everything hits the fan. And uh, to be candid, and so we're like in this heated argument, and I checked out. I, I was like, I, I had a busy week, and that could be excused. But I just be candid. I checked out. I actually walked out of the room, and what came up for my beloved wife was that. That was the pattern that she grew up with with her parents. So she began to withdraw, get angry, and I just said, oh God, help me. So I went, moved towards her, walked back into the room, took her by each shoulder lovingly and looked in her eyes and said, 
I am really sorry. Will you forgive me? I was wrong. To hear her heart, because she was wanting me to see her pain and see the tension that we were under. So even, even after 34 years and on our anniversary weekend, things happen. Well, thank you for sharing that story because something that I see in, in that story is vulnerability in action. So I think vulnerability is a risk because you're opening yourself up to somebody or your spouse or a coworker or whoever you're deciding to trust and basically like lay it all out. You're laying it all out trusting that they're gonna protect that thing but the risk is always that they can take it, squash it, use it against you, right? And so that's oftentimes why a lot of us don't have rich relationships. It's because that vulnerability is a risk. What I see modeled in this is you have spent time in vulnerability with each other to know, well, my family, you know, they would scream and leave or we'd start a fight and then disappear and that that's a wound for me or my family, we just yelled all the time. That's a wound for me. You know that about each other and that's a risk to share with each other because we can use it against each other. But what I love is the heart of God in you said, pause, I've, I've, I've used this against her, I need to go apologize. And I also love that it's never too late to apologize, but boy, when somebody does it, when we can do it quickly, we save ourselves a weekend in an Airbnb. So, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to dissect that a little bit because I think that is beautiful to see that vulnerability in action and to see trust in action and risk in action, but like your marriage is better for it and we as witnesses are, are better for it because we can learn from it, yeah. right? Um, I'm going to share a little bit just about like being a younger married, newlier, new, newlier, newer married, <laughs> newer married. Um, you know, five years in, we haven't had like tumultuous things, praise God, because we did a lot of work beforehand. And just like many of us in this room, like we come with family baggage. We come with past relationships that, you know, we just put it in our luggage and we're carrying it into this new one with us, which... Some of that's preventable. Some of it can be healed, and some of it, you don't see it until you're face-to-face -face with it. And um, I think Joe and I really set ourselves up well for the early years because we took time. Like, we dated for three years to take time because I came with a lot of stuff. Um, I was actually so passionate about marriage, but at the same time terrified of marriage because all I had seen around me is divorce. My parents are divorced. My aunts and uncles are divorced. My grandparents are divorced. Like, ev there's one set of grandparents on my dad's side that is not, but kind of everybody else around me, I, it, it, it failed. And so there was part of me that's like, I'm going to find the one and we're going to make it work. But part of the risk with that is I was finding not the ones and fighting to make it work, meanwhile being trapped in some not great abusive situations and domestic violence situations. And coming out of that, still had this desire for a beautiful marriage, but was really insecure about what it looked like. And so I did, like David said, I was like, I'm gonna listen to every pastor talk about marriage. I'm gonna read every book about how to have a good marriage. I just want to know what is the ticket yeah, the ticket is God. Like the ticket is everything that we're reading through. And so I was seeking God, what is it? What does it look like? What am I looking for? Because my picker is broken and I'm getting discouraged, but I want this so badly. And so through my mentor, through my pastors and the things I was learning and through prayer, God and I sat down and I was like, I need it to be simple, strip it back. I just want five things that when, when a gentleman asks me to go to dinner or get coffee or if I think somebody is attractive and inspiring and I want to get to know them, I need a filter. So I had these five things and one was they have to love God. They have to be fully submitted to God. They have to honor him with all their heart and soul and mind. Otherwise, this will not work. Two, you have to honor my past because we all have one and mine was a little rough. And so there were some things that bringing into a marriage, especially, you know, when you, you want to save yourself, you want to wait for your spouse for specific situations and experiences, I didn't get that. 
And so to present that to somebody else was also really scary to be vulnerable and say, this is not, this is probably not what you were praying for, but this is what I got. And I needed somebody who would honor that story and walk with me through what it meant next. Three, I needed somebody who honored my family. My family is really important to me. We've been through a lot. And one of the relationships I was in pulled me from my family, restricted communication, and I was away from them for three years. And so I didn't want to repeat that mistake again. Like there's, there's such thing as like, so a man marries his woman and they start their own family, but there's also family. You don't, it, just because you're married doesn't mean you sever. You know, there's healthy boundaries when required, but I need somebody who honored my family because I really wanted my family to be a part of my life. Number four was I needed somebody who worked hard because I'm a really hard worker. I will outwork my husband as a challenge. <laughs> but it's also like natural. I grew up on a, with a ranching family. Like the sun's up, you're working, the sun's down. That's when you rest. Otherwise, we're working. Um, so I needed somebody who was willing to put in effort because I'm a hard worker. And the last thing was that I needed somebody bold and courageous because this can be a lot. So <laughs> I can be spicy for sport, as some would say. Um, but I needed somebody who was bold enough to take on the challenge of being with me in a marriage that's going to shape me to be the woman that God made me to be. And I'm so thankful that I met Joe and, and he succeeded in, in qualifying for all five. So congratulations, we did it, you did it. <laughs> but that was really helpful to one, feel safe and secure, to be vulnerable and to step into a relationship under the covenant where we're protected, I feel secure because my husband is one who lays before the Lord, as Dawn described. In Ephesians 5, right before we get into all the marriage talk, it says, follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So I have two questions and then we're going to close. The first would be, do you have any practical ways that we in relationships, not just marriage, but in all relationships, can practice this vulnerability and communication in a way that's really helpful to make sure that we're all good. Yeah. Yes. Oh. So, so we were married a year, and uh, as you know, I was a young pastor, and, I, and this is the 90s, and uh, Norm Wright was a marriage counselor. Most of you don't know him, but he was really popular in the 90s, Norm Wright. He was doing a marriage conference in beautiful La Jolla, California, and we were in Orange County. And so I signed up, I got advanced ticketing, I got us a hotel, and then I said, okay, baby, pack your bags, we're gonna, I'm gonna surprise you. And she goes, okay, what are we gonna do? And I said, we're gonna go to a marriage conference. <laughs> I started to cry because, <laughs> Because I immediately was like, he hates me, and I ne he needs to take me somewhere, so I'll be a better wife. And that was as far from the truth at, at that point. Yeah, so he, was, he convinced me it was good. No, this is good. We, we need to check under the hood about once a year here. <laughs> But uh, Jess, your, your question about just like ways to initiate vulnerability have been some of the ways that I would say we have a marriage that we really, really have always hoped for. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you think about it, vulnerability is just being real and honest yeah. and one thing that we have learned to do is listen to one another, not to fix or advise or solve, just to really hear. And so I know what David fears on any given day of the week and vice versa. And the, the places in a day that I would feel like I failed or I would know I messed up big time, he would he hears me, he listens to me, and he holds me. Yeah. 
-hmm. And that has been uh, a place to build trust. He doesn't use the things that I share in vulnerability against me. He, He holds me and encourages me. Real quick, uh, I I hurt my wife for a long, long time. If you're out here or you're listening online, uh, it's never too late to risk. It's never too late to be known. And I just want to encourage you. It's okay not to be okay, and to it's worth the fight to say to be fully known. This is who I am, and then bringing everything into the light. So we, we don't do this perfectly, but we get together and say, this is what I'm challenged with. This is what I'm tempted with. This is, I'm feeling insecure as a pastor, or I'm not getting along with this leader, or I'm being tempted in this area, or I'm, or I'm feeling uh, less than my heart, or I'm feeling pulled to this. I don't know why. So I, this is my best friend that I can come to and say, honey, I'm, I need you. And I need you to be candid and honest and bring everything in the light. And then we're going to go to God together. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think for Joe and I, we really make it an intentional thing that every day we ask, how's, how's your constitution? So that's like physically, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. How's your constitution on a scale one to 10? If we need to talk about it, we dive in. Um, we also have learned that There's like, you know, we talk about the love languages and all that fancy stuff. There are real things that my husband needs from me that I'm the only person that gets to fulfill. And there's things that he's the only person who can fulfill for me. I love quality time and I need that. And there's times where I'm like, can you just, I just need you to put your phone down for five minutes even. I just need to just sit here. You know, last night he, I just said, can we just like scoot closer on the couch? And he's like, oh, do you need closeness? And I'm like, yeah, I I just need closeness. (laughs) And it wasn't, it wasn't like full on like snuggling. It was just like, can you just sit here? (laughs) And that makes me feel better for this moment and today. And then we also do monthly checkups where we just have a family, a family meeting and we say, how are our accounts? And sure, we talk about the budget, but it's also in our marriage. Like how, how are you? How are we doing? What do you need from me? Is there any way that I missed this month? Because sometimes life happens, and sometimes it's, well, I know her heart. She didn't mean it. I'm just going to tuck it away, and you go on. And just because we learn to just cope and deal and whatever, whatever, but to create a safe space where it's there's no offense, just lay it out. Be real with me. Be honest with me, because my desire is to do better and be there for you. I just say, just the practical things every single day. I mean, you, you need to respect each other's heart. You need to serve each other in love. And those little things are so little, but every day we hug. And, you know, it's kind of crazy, but, you know, when we were um, had kids, we'd hold hands around the dinner table when we did our meals together. But now that we're empty nesters, we actually, we hug each other. We stand there and pray over our meals as we're hugging each other. And that's like that sweet moment of contact. If I'm home, I try to go to the door and, and greet him with a kiss and a hug. It's, it's just those little things. A big thing we do is, there's two big things. We pray together, and that might be, we just when we crawl into bed at night, you know, it might be just like five minutes, but we pray together every single day. And another thing is, we're nice to each other. You know, that's a simple thing. Sometimes it just gets so complicated. We expect our kids to be really nice to each other, but do we model it? And um, we check in with each other. He doesn't obviously give me his day-to-day, like, moment-by-moment schedule. But if he's going to do something out of the ordinary, I get a text. Hey, hon, this is what I'm doing, vice versa. That isn't control. That's respect. Yeah, that's love. That's, good, that's really, really so good. good. So good. So good. I just want to say, too, before, that we do have resources here. We're, we're not the answer. Jesus is the answer. But we do have pastoral counseling here at Hope Church, and we have ministries within Hope Church, and also we can refer you to other ministries in this valley. We're very, very blessed. They have some really phenomenal ministries in this valley. So please, if you're sitting out there going, okay, what do I do next? I need help. I don't know where to go. You can call the church office. Uh, We are here to help. We're here to step out and be a part of that. Good stuff. It's really quick, just check in. Is there anybody who's leaving with something helpful today 
Perfect. I'm going to hand it over to Don, and he's going to lead us in how we're going to close today. So I felt the, uh, the Lord just download a couple of thoughts for me just to kind of wrap it up for us today. Um, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being gracious and patient. And we hope that uh, whether you're married or you're single or, or uh, somewhere in between, uh, hope that God is touching your heart today and, and giving you some encouragement. You know, as a, as a couples counselor, and, and I counsel individuals as well, but, um, you know, historically, the church has done counseling by talking about love and respect, and that's good stuff, and we need love and respect. Uh, we, as Bev said, she said it just kind of simple, as, as we just need to be nice to each other. You know, that's, that's not a bad idea. Uh, one of the scriptures that, that uh, Pastor Lance had put on, on our list was Ephesians uh, 4.32. And it said, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Yeah. And, then, and then we said, do, do, doodly-do, Ephesians 4.32. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you remember it. Uh, <clears throat> but in the, in the world of psychotherapy uh, and couples counseling, we used to, it used to be the, the practice to just simply try to reduce your expectations. You know, if, if you didn't expect so much out of marriage, you wouldn't be so disappointed. No, this was really the, the method. And so you just kind of say, well, yeah, you know, this ain't Hollywood, sweetheart. And, and so you just try to reduce their expectations. And uh, we, we spent time, and we do spend time in the counseling room talking about skill development and communication skills and conflict resolution skills and uh, sexual intimacy and what the wife needs, what the husband needs. We, we get into that, finances. Those are all issues that come up in the counseling room we can dig into the hurts of the past and all of those things but you know I'm going to tell you a secret today and uh, I fell in love with Beverly 52 years ago because of her fragrance and, and I, I brought uh, today uh, uh, this uh, this is the fragrance she wore when I first met her. Uh, it was Avon. <laughs> it, it was called Rejeance. And I, I keep this in the windowsill out in my garage on my man bench. But I'm not talking about that fragrance. You see, what, what happened is it was about the irresistible fragrance of Jesus my prayer for myself in my marriage with my wife is that I would be irresistible my prayer for her is that she would be irresistible why? because we become the aroma of Christ and you know, I don't want you to be discouraged. That doesn't happen in a day. It doesn't happen in a moment. We surrender our lives to Jesus. We ask Jesus to come into our hearts, to forgive us our sins, and to be Lord of our lives. And that's where it starts. It begins there. And if you've never had that experience, you can, you can have that experience today. You can just say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. And I surrender my life to you now. Please come into my life. Forgive me my sins and be Lord of my life. And if you say that and you mean it in your heart, it's a done deal. It's an eternal transaction that he makes with us. But you know, that's just the beginning. And then we get the joy of walking together with him every day. Every day, we, when I first came to Jesus, I read, I read this, 
uh, in, in the letter of, of Peter and it said, be holy for I am holy. And I thought, oh man, too late. And when I wrote to Beverly and, and, and I, because I, I just, I had this shame in my heart for the way I had lived my life and I was 20, 21 years old and I wrote to her and she reminded me that in Christ I'm a new creature and that old things be, are passing away and God is making all things new. And from that time to the present, sometimes with great falls and crashes, but I get up and the Lord helps me up and he dusts me off and he says, I got you because it's Christ in me, my hope of glory. I was talking with a friend yesterday and, and he said, you know, if you're free, we ought to see the glory. I want to ask you to stand this morning. In just a minute as we close and I'm going to invite, I want to invite the elders and the prayer team peeps up here to, to come up. If you would, please, come on up and, and, and face those folks because we want to pray for you. That includes you, you know. Oh, okay. We just want, and, and David and Elizabeth, we want to, we want to line up across this way and 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 here's some folks that want to pray with you no matter no matter what's going on in your life it doesn't have to be marriage conflict but what i would like to suggest to us is that every day is a new opportunity to surrender more to jesus and as we do that, as we practice it, I, Bev and I also, wherever she went, we, oh, there, there she is. Uh, we both dig into the Bible every morning. The first thing I, I look forward to is when I get out of bed, I'm going to grab my coffee cup and I'm going to sit in my spot and I'm going to open the Bible. And I, I highlight things in the Bible and then I put my finger on it. And I say, God, I want to be like that. God, I want to be like that. Make me like that. Jesus, make me your aroma. And the more that I have the fragrance of Jesus, the more irresistible I am to my beloved. And the more she is irresistible to me. And that's true in our workplace. It's true in our parent-child relationships. It's true in our friendships. How many of you have a friend that just exudes Jesus? You get around them and you feel Jesus and you, and you say, whoa, I want to hang out with that person. That's the fragrance of Christ. That's the aroma. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to invite you all to come up here and we just want to pray for you today for if we want... You don't have to have a bad marriage to get prayer. We just want to bless you. Bless you. We want to bless your marriages. We want to bless your relationships. If you're a single person, we want to bless you as well. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that we might be increasingly the fragrance of Christ. God, that you would so live in us, so fill us with your spirit, so fill us with your love and your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your, all of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, God, that we would reflect and we would uh, exude the very fragrance of Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen.